process, best practices, and open innovation in conversation with our guests here, Forrester and Yale. We're excited to get started here, but before we begin, I just wanted to let you know how we're managing the time. This session is set up as sort of an interview format. We'll be posing questions both to Chip Gleedman and the innovation team at Yale. Um, we'll get through the initial set of questions in about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up in the last 15 minutes for additional questions. Um, it's probably best to hold all questions until that time. However, as the presentation progresses, I'll be keeping an eye on the question feed here. And if it's a good stopping point, I'll step in and I'll try and ask it then. Also, of course, if anyone wants to follow up with questions afterwards, I'm glad to get them answered either by our speakers or if there are questions about idea skill, I'm glad to answer those as well. I also wanted to let everyone know that we are recording this webinar, so it will be possible to access it up to one month after the event is over. We'll send out a notice to everyone who registered with a link where they can find it online. And of course, if you have any other questions about the video or accessing this information, forward them to me. Um, so let's get started. Um, I'd love to take a moment to introduce our participants. We have Chip Gleedman. Uh, we want to say hello, Chip. Hi, Jessica. Hi, everybody else. Um, I'm Chip Gladman. I'm with Forrester Research. Uh, one of my areas of, of coverage is innovation. And over the last couple of years, I have probably talked to the innovation teams and looked at the innovation processes at oh, 100, 150 different organizations. And I'll share what, some of that with uh, you today. Great. Thank you, Chip. We also have the team here um, from Yale, the Yale IT Innovation Alignment Team. Um, we've got Lou Rinaldi and Brian Kasdan with us. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Lou Rinaldi here with my partner, Brian Kasdan, uh, with Yale University, where we are privileged to be part of the Innovation Alignment Team. Uh, the team was created by our CIO, Len Peters, and charged with maintaining the innovation process for central IT at Yale, and also ensuring that our innovation initiatives align with the organizational strategic goals. And we're happy to be with you today. Thanks, guys. Um, so without further ado, let's just jump into some of these questions that we've called from our client base. Uh, we get a lot of questions on a pretty regular basis, and we want to sort of ask Chip to give us some broad-based best practices about how he sees innovation, but also talk to you guys about how you're doing it live in an idea scale community. So one of those questions, um, let's, let's start, Chip, with what makes innovation different than other programs? Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's slide three. Um, yep, there it is. So I'll just sort of walk you through the way we think about, you know, looking at innovation and, and how it, it's different. So if you think about, you know, an organization and, and what it does, the blue box in this, it sort of, it has products and services and their processes and operations, uh, markets, organization, governance models. Um, and, and companies have those in place and by definition, they look to improve them. They look to do things differently. They, you know, if they don't, they're likely going to, you know, wither and die in the marketplace. So as you, you overlay that, you can almost think about the domain of ideas um, from making incremental changes to your products or your processes or your market or business model or your organization. You know, and, and you know what those are. Those are fairly standardized. They're low risk. Uh, you know, they're a step ahead uh, uh, to the side of what you're doing. Um, in some cases, they may be operational. In some cases, they may be mandatory. They may come from internal or customers or management or who knows where. But, you know, the idea is that you're going to take something and move it a step, and the odds are you've got a governance process and a business case process to evaluate them. On the other extreme, you've got the radical ideas, the radical changes. And that can be, you know, buying a company or entering a broad new market or, or rolling out a major new product or, or business change. Um, they're game changing, they're non-standard, they're high risk. They likely have, you know, are, have ha a lot of management involvement, board of director involvement. They likely will have a lot of uh, analysis 
behind them, and you, you're not going to do that many of them, you know, one, two, a few a year in, in, in some cases. But if you're doing more than that, you likely have a, a, a dedicated team that's looking at acquisitions or, or major new marketing, you know, opportunities. So someplace in the middle, though, is this area that we're sort of calling sustained innovation. It's broader than the incremental, but not quite up to the radical. It's, it's ideas that may lead to something, you know, that'll produce business value later. Um, I've heard one definition of innovation is uh, invention turned into business value. What we want to think about doing is making that into a sustained or sustainable process. So you're constantly feeding the pipe with these, you know, these new inventions that you're going to see how to turn into business value. But this group is different. And, you know, if you look at some of the characteristics of the sustained innovation, um, and you really want it to be ongoing and not episodic. But you also realize that because it's, it's a bit farther out, you likely need a distinct governance process. You can't write a business case for some of these ideas at their early stage. Um, you likely are not going to fund them in the same way. And in, in fact, uh, we'll talk about funding later perhaps, but you know, organizations that try to balance operational funding and innovation funding oftentimes run into issues because you know, when you're pulling money from something that might help this quarter, towards something that's longer term, it, 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 you know, makes some people uncomfortable. So there's, and there are different success and failure metrics. So we have to think about how we manage this world differently. Um, I think the next one just sort of summarizes it all. We can leave it up for a little while. But, you know, you can see the, the, the ideas come from different sources. Um, and then the target success rates. You're moving from 100% success targets at the extremes to potentially something more like a venture capitalist would look at, maybe 50%, 70%, 80%. One idea that produces a lot, I think, is, is what I, I heard from the folks at Yale in, in, our, in some of our conversations. Um, but you can see that uh, it's a different measure of risk, a different measure of success, and something we need to wrap our heads around you know, differently than we do the other, the other parts of the world. Excellent. And, what, you know, along with that, who are the key players when it comes to an innovation program? Who's, who's, um, who's putting their, their foot in the, the pot here? Well, I, I'll just, uh, you know, a, a introduce it, but I don't, why don't you skip to and go to the, the, the chart that has, uh, um, yeah, the, the sustained, the seven. There, it, there we go. One way that, that we help to, to, to frame this, and, and, uh, and the folks from Yale will give you some practical, I'm sure, um, is we, we looked at what capabilities you need to deliver to have a sustained innovation program. Um, and we, we determined that basically you need these nine capabilities in these three different buckets. You need capabilities to generate and manage the ideas, to fund and incubate the exploration of them, and then to manage the suite of, of things that you're looking at over time and deciding when to turn things into um, you know, business, business value products. You need to have implementation structures. You need to manage change. You need to manage incentives, communications. And then you need, control, you need to have governance processes and capabilities, funding and measurement. So now you can start thinking about who do I need to plug into each of these boxes? Uh, and it'll vary for each organization and what their goals are. But uh, you can see that you can basically build, you know, what we call a racy chart, uh, responsible, accountable, um, informed. And I think actually the next slide has, you know, an example of that for one of the boxes. Um, and, and you can see that in this case, it's, it's really, uh, you know, we broke it down. If you're looking at the, at the ideation box in that, um, Determine who's going to be accountable or responsible for it, uh, who's going to be consulted on it, who's going to be informed on it, and look at, you know, how you're going to staff, what, what it's going to look like. Um, and it'll vary by box. You know, the next, next slide has, I think, a, an example for, you know, another of the boxes, the incubation. So once an idea comes in, 
it's funded for further exploration. So now the innovation steering team may be, you know, driving the process of, the, of prototyping and exploration. Um, and again, it will vary, you know, and these, these RACIs will move, you know, to different people. And, and I think in the governance one, I think I put up uh, as another example of something completely different. So, cons you know, there's, you know, now for the, for the governance piece, you're not going to be involving the, all of the, uh, the staff or the customers, the trading partners in the same way that you would for, for the other pieces. So just again, a framework to think about who you get involved, how broad your program is, what their roles and responsibilities are, and how they change as you're, as you're looking across your, your program. Interesting. And I know that, so Yale completed a pilot program last year where they were looking to meet some targets set forth by one of their, their directors. And they completed a pilot program, had a lot of great lessons learned. So I was wondering who the key innovation players are in that program. Sure. So uh, one of the challenges that we face as we're developing our process is that uh, Yale ITS is a, a reasonably large organization, you know, around 500 uh, employees. And, you know, it's, it's a challenge to, uh, to, to get everyone uh, moving in the same direction with this stuff. So we, we looked at a sort of a distributed workload model, uh, you know, similar to uh, some of the roles that Chip's been talking about. So we've got these concepts of the users, which is, the, you know, currently the ITS staff community and eventually, you know, the, the university community. And we've got advocates uh, who we call champions, who are designated ITS staff members who are, you know, subject matter experts in specific areas who, you know, pl play a more domain-specific role in the process. Uh, they, they're responsible for sort of, um, you know, looking at the intake and doing some of the triage and refinement um, of these ideas as they come into their specific domain. Then as we move from the ideation phase over into the implementation and execution side, we've got, uh, we've obviously got leadership, you know, uh, executives in, in a position to make decisions about moving forward with an idea or not and, and resourcing questions and those kinds of things. And then they are in turn assigning idea owners who uh, more broadly would probably be known as the implementers to sort of take ownership of an individual idea and shepherd it through to execution and completion. So uh, th those are generally the, the four categories of roles that, uh, that we look at in our process. And then, of course, you know, uh, guiding all of this activity is the innovation alignment team. I think Chip uh, made reference to to the steering uh, the, the steering of these efforts. That's what our alignment team does. You know, think of it sort of as the uh, the guardrails on the highway to make sure that these initiatives remain aligned with organizational and strategic goals, and that we're you know we're making measurable progress toward the, toward those. Right. Yeah. You generally, this is Chip. You know, you very often those groups are sort of internal consultants. Um, they're they're experts on the process and the the skills, um, and share that with the subject matter experts um, on almost a consultative basis. You know, being free agents that can can move around and and help support the efforts in lots of different areas. And is that what you're doing, Brian? I'm sorry, Chip. Can uh, can you repeat that, please? <laughs> sure. I was saying that in many organizations, that sort of the, whether it's the steering team or or, or you know the, the leadership team of the innovation almost acts as internal consultants to the uh, to the to the subject matter experts and to everybody else. You know, they're the ones versed on the process and and the goals and and how to get things done well and and the rules. Um, of when when people should put their fingers in the pie and when they should take them out of the pie, um, and they sort of act as as sort of free agents and consultants to to help uh, the broad program across the organization. And it sounds like that's sorry, sort of a similar model to what you're using. Yes. So sorry about that, Chip. Uh, this is Brian, and uh, absolutely, uh, our alignment team has somewhat organically grown into that position. Uh, and it, it came out of a, a bit of a necessity. And 
we are absolutely in a position where making sure that, that while we try to align ourselves with the goals of the IT organization, we, we don't want to leave the innovative process behind. Uh, so we are definitely uh, grooming the process on an ongoing basis and uh, making sure that it, it's not forgotten. And it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a bi-directional kind of activity in that the alignment team is trying to disseminate these, uh, this knowledge and these habits as we, we move toward a more innovative culture here in ITS. But we're also gathering feedback. We try to keep those loops open constantly, particularly with the champions who are sort of our direct line to, you know, to the ground level in that sense. We want it to be uh, ongoing feedback loops and, and uh, continuously improving the way we do things. And, and one of the ways that we're able to do that is not by, uh, you know, making guesses locked away in a conference room, but by getting actual real feedback from people who are doing these activities and stepping through this process every day. So we, uh, we take that extremely seriously, and we consider all that feedback to be a, uh, to be a gift. Well, I was, I was going to say that that's one of the questions that we get a lot is, you know, is, is who is who are we directing this conversation to? Is innovation best when it's wide open and boundless, or is it better if it's to a targeted group? And that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, Chip. Well, I, and, and I'll say yes <laughs> to, to that <laughs> answer. Um, when you have a process and a group and you're, you're able to, to drive – you know, the, the notion of innovation through the organization, when it's realized as being important, when it's, it's funded well, you can broaden it. In some cases, especially for organizations just starting out, some cases you might not have the broad support, and you may find a partner in a single business unit or a product manager, um, and you can work in a sense with them on a targeted innovation program, looking for ideas for product, or looking for ideas to enter a specific market, or looking at ideas to cut waste in the lunchroom, or looking for ideas to make your you know, community healthier. I mean, these doesn't have to be technology, they don't have to be product, they don't have to, they can be anything. So, you know, some organizations start focused or, or keep going focused in a sense and have different challenges based around these different themes. Um, others go a little broader and when they have the, the resources and the culture and the capabilities, you know, cast a wider net. Um, look for areas of improvement, you know, across the organization or across the field. Um, the trick there is just to make sure that things don't fall through the cracks. Uh, and that, uh, you know, you, you don't, in essence, just turn the innovation program into an electronic suggestion box, you know, where, you know, the little slips of paper go in, you know, the little slips of bits go in, and then they're never seen again. Um, right. So, again, you can do it either way. You can do it both ways. A lot of it is, is based on the relationship that the innovation team has with the rest of the organization. What, so, so for the uh, Yale Innovation Alignment Team, I mean, how did you choose to, why, why did you choose to keep it broad? How did you focus the scope on, on the broad audience? So we actually began uh, with opening it up uh, as a generalized campaign uh, within our IT community about a year ago, and uh, we, we received a tremendous amount of feedback that came in, and it was actually extremely successful. Uh, had a large number of ideas. Ultimately, what ended up happening is, is that we didn't have our process in place at that time, and that led us to a lot of learning about uh, what we needed to have as a support structure uh, in order to bring those ideas uh, beyond just discussion and actually into a little bit of implementation. Um, as we've gone through uh, additional campaigns, and begun to uh, broaden this into uh, in, in another open uh, sort of idea collection um, and innovation process, uh, we have come to the conclusion that uh, we absolutely must maintain a process no matter what. Um, if, uh, if, if it's a closed campaign or if it's open to all ideas, without some form of structure behind it, 
uh, it, it leads to frustration uh, for all of the involved parties. So, and, and I'll follow up on that by saying that some of the things that Chip highlighted are actually the things that, uh, that came back to bite us after our initial uh, effort. You know, we turned on the faucet of ideas and we didn't really have, uh, uh, we hadn't really thought through how we're going to communicate back to all these, uh, these people who are engaging with us in good faith and really how we're going to follow everything through the whole, uh, the life cycle. And, you know, it, 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 was, uh, it was very eye-opening, and it was, it, you know, one of those things where you learn from experience, and a, a lot of uh, what, what Chip's talking about now in terms of what's necessary for a more open-ended uh, approach to this, it's incredibly validating for us to hear, because these were conclusions that we sort of came to, as like Brian said, organically, and we're also very fortunate to have, you know, uh, executive sponsorship at the highest level, uh, our CIO, has uh, lent his full and very vocal support to this initiative because he truly believes in um, harnessing innovation for IT at Yale to, to, to improve our services. You know, in, in, a service, uh, in a service organization, the way that innovation becomes real, again, is by tying it to those strategic goals and objectives. And that's, you know, his vision to, to be able to gather these ideas and you know, it's not to say that you can't have specific ideas come in, and that's why, again, we, go, we, we leverage that champion model, because based on our categories, the way we've broken them out within idea scale, it's entirely possible to have, you know, a, a more targeted focus while also maintaining that open-ended uh, intake valve. So I guess you could almost say that we're, we're doing a sort of a hybridized approach there. That makes sense. And it's also one of the other questions we get a lot is about communication. You know, what should the frequency of communication be within an open innovation program? I, I think the Yale people have the best answer to this. Definitely. So, uh, <laughs> so the, the communication around this process is built on trust and, and what we call authentic engagement. And we're asking everyone in the organization to sort of take a leap of faith and uh, open up a little bit to us and trust that they can share their ideas in, in an honest and, and, and open manner and still feel safe. And the way that we keep that sort of trust going is by, you know, we don't leave any open loops. Every possible outcome of this innovation process that we've designed here uh, is paired with a loop closing communication and it may be, you know, that, that the idea will move forward and that it's being sponsored and it's going to, you know, be implemented or it may be it's just not right for this point in time. We may want to revisit this when certain environmental conditions change or, or what have you. But the point is we're not leaving anyone hanging. We don't want anyone, like, like Chip said earlier, we don't want anyone to feel like I've taken time out of my day voluntarily to, to contribute what I feel is a meaningful and valuable idea, and I feel like it's gone into some kind of a black hole. Uh, the minute we do that, we've effectively broken authentic engagement, and the communication also has to be empathic. It's got to be, uh, you know, tailored in such a way that it's sensitive. Uh, you know, we're not trying to be a sort of uh, knee-jerk robotic response. Uh, you know, idea declined. You know, that's one of the things that we're working on right now is how can we build more empathy into our communications? You know, it's, uh, it's something that we're, we're very cognizant of and we, we're, it's one of the aspects of the process that we're working on improving. It's definitely, it sounds like you've sort of addressed what successful engagement is and how and then those tactics for improve, improving them making sure that the communications are timely and real and that you close all the loops. Um, I was wondering if we could talk about what some of the measures for program success are. Like, Chip, you want to introduce maybe some broad ideas for what success looks like, and then Yale maybe talk about some of the metrics that you're measuring your community against. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, before I do, I'll kick in. I'm going to kick in a word or two. I loved what, you know, we, when we talked earlier, what, what they said about trust. Um, and then I just wanted to emphasize that that's something we've seen across the board. Um, people are going out of their comfort zone. They are taking risks. They are spending their time. 
uh, and closing the loop on each one is is absolutely critical and it was just such a pleasure to hear that uh, that there is an organization that that doesn't just only inform the winners but everyone of ever everything that's absolutely critical um, but I wanted to hear it I wanted them to say it rather than than anyone else um, mm -hmm. metrics let's think about metrics when we think about metrics we want to think operational metrics and outcome metrics um, we need to make sure that the process is running smoothly and not bogged down so in the case of, of the things we're just talking about that that there is a timely response to every question that um, or every submission that things are sent to the champions and they do respond you know within X number of days or weeks you know these are are, are, are operational kinds of things that just make sure that you know the, the 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 pig is moving through the snake to use a bad metaphor um, mm -hmm. But you know, it, it, the process is going, and it, it's it's continually working, and just monitoring it, you know, how it's working. The outcome metrics are where we see, you know, the business value. That's that's what we're really looking for. We're not looking for ideas. We're looking for business value. Um, so we want to be thinking about, you know, what is the business, you know, value delivered, and and. You know, I'll warn you that in many of these ideas, especially the ones that aren't incremental, that may be one or two years away until we uh, explore something and test how we're going to make it work and find out what, how we're going to solve a, a problem and then, you know, schedule it and train people and, and change the way the organization works. The real value may be one, you know, year, 18 months, two years down the road. Uh, but we need to keep our eyes on it. Um, the the analogy I want to say is, and I'll say it if you know again is, when you're thinking about innovation, you're thinking about venture capitalists. You want to make a number of investments in some things that look like they might pan out, and we want to incubate them, and we want to help them and nurture them. And if we get one out of ten, or two, or three out of ten that are big wins and one or two or three that are small wins we've done really well and those would be great numbers for a venture capitalist and we should be thinking of our metrics our outcome metrics very much in those kinds of terms excellent and what kind of what kind, what are some of those metrics that you're laddering up to um, in terms of what what, do, what defines your success within your community at Yale? So we, uh, we look at a couple of different things. Um, you know, what defines success for us is, you know, something that's measurable against our CIO's critical goals for the organization. So every fiscal year, you know, we've, we've got a list. Uh, this particular year it's seven. And they're very specific goals. So, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples. Achieve 90% community satisfaction by 2015, or um, you know, overall ready to serve capacity needs are reduced to 80% by fiscal 16. So they're very, you know, when you think of SMART goals, they're very specific, measurable, actionable, all of that. So in in one sense, the way that we measure success is the outcomes of of the innovation process that we've developed. If those outcomes are, you know, observably and demonstrably advancing those critical goals, moving the needle along toward those target numbers, then we consider that to be successful. Um, and that's sort of the more uh, quantitative uh, way of looking at success. But I also I, I want to give Brian a chance to talk about another way that we measure success, which is really just uh, a notion of inclusiveness for the organization. So when, when we're looking at the, the metrics, one of the things that we, we're trying to also measure is the activity of this innovation process as a whole. And we've been relying quite a bit on the, uh, the data exports that are available through the IdeaScale platform. And we use the, the data that comes out of IdeaScale in order to uh, figure out just how active and involved our community is. Uh, find out which groups, which departments are most active. Uh, we're able to figure out uh, which uh, categories uh, or 
uh, subject areas have been really kind of very active with their ability to uh, come up with new ideas. And it gives us some targets to, uh, to really aim for improvement in the areas that maybe aren't coming up with as many uh, great ideas. Um, and it, it leads us to determining where we should be uh, placing our campaign efforts. Yeah, we want to see a broad spectrum of activity throughout the organization. I mean, this is this truly is a major cultural shift that we're talking about. And in order to do that, you know, you've got to have everyone on board. And that's not to say that, you know, all of your various cylinders are going to be firing 100% of the time. But you want to make sure that you've got, you know, representation in every corner of the organization to, to some degree. Because every aspect, every element of the organization can be improved in some way. And we want to make sure that we're reaching everyone who's, you know, actively engaged and cares about making those improvements. Uh, because if we're missing, if anyone's not on our radar, then we're not doing our job. So it's, it's extremely important for us as members of the alignment team to be fully inclusive of the entire organization and to make sure that these habits that we're trying to develop do become the culture for everyone and not just a, one group or another group. Well, I think now is, of course, a great time to mention that uh, the Yale Information Technology, Service, Information Technology Services team was a winner of the Open Innovation Awards Best Moderation Strategy because they've really thought through the process. And I think it would be a great time to look at their very um, comprehensive and sophisticated but also straightforward moderation plan and have them sort of give us an overview of, of what that process looks like. So what we're effectively looking at here is the, uh, the innovation process that uh, we've been developing over the last two years. Uh, it has constantly uh, been growing and, uh, and it's been modified in order to, uh, to accommodate uh, the, the plans that we have. Um, it, it does look somewhat complicated and there are a large number of steps, uh, but the most important thing to realize is that uh, a large number of those steps are making sure that we are always closing the loop on those communications. I know that we, we went over it a little bit before, um, but uh, you can see at the bottom of this, uh, of this diagram that uh, all of those oval-shaped uh, final outputs, are they, those are closing loops on communication. And, uh, and no matter what phase of the process we're at, that is always uh, something that is on our minds. Um, we have essentially broken down uh, our, our process um, into seven major steps. Um, we take ideas in from our, our users, and, uh, and those ideas generally come into idea scale. Um, we triage them into appropriate categories. Um, and in, in our idea scale environment, we used the, uh, the string tool uh, in order to rename our campaigns into categories. Uh, nice little flexibility there. Um, and so we make sure that everything is properly tagged and categorized during our triage phase. Uh, at, at that point, our ideas come into a refinement section where we go and allow our advocates, which we call champions, to engage with the user community. That's where we, we are looking to build uh, that authentic engagement and try to drive ideas that are not possibly, or, or at some level not ready for prime time uh, within our ecosystem and try to, to bring them into alignment so that we can use those ideas and to flesh them out. Um, at a certain point, uh, those champions determine if an idea is available and ready to be delivered to business leadership. And once it's, so th that happens at that, uh, that big blue line that goes across the entire page. And that's the moment that ideas really transfer over from just that ide ideation component into an implementation segment. So that escalation, uh, brings it into the processes that we already have available and working in, in our IT department here at Yale. Uh, our leadership uh, teams will take a, take a look and they'll talk with the champion. 
they'll engage with the uh, with the, the population of our of idea scale, and they make a decision uh, either way, whether they decide to move forward with reviewing an idea or whether they decide that it's time to or to defer an idea. Uh, a communication is made, and at that point. The idea then can, if it, if it goes forward, it would go into the review status where it's handed off to someone who has the actual capability to determine if that idea can be accomplished and what resources it would take to accomplish it. Once that's been evaluated, leadership needs to make an additional decision uh, that will determine whether or not uh, that idea should begin to go forward to actually be uh, accomplished. So we go from our decision to our ownership to our final implementation phase. So one thing to keep in mind if you want to just distill this very complex, admittedly complex diagram down to its essence, we're looking to pair great ideas with capable leaders. Uh, it's, it's really about connecting those two sides of the equation. Uh, very often when we hear people talk about innovation, they're thinking about ideation and they're not really thinking a whole lot about the execution phase. And they really are, you know, part and parcel. Uh, you know, you, you, one really cannot exist without the other. You cannot have success, successful innovation initiatives if you're not able to execute on the great ideas that you're generating and developing. So that's really the, the overarching goal of this process is to make sure that uh, everything moves along through the process. We're, we, we identify the great ideas. We pair them with the right leadership. Uh, who then can you know facilitate their execution, and that we're not letting anything get stuck along the way. That we've again we've distributed that that workload throughout the champion population, the advocate population, and everyone is sort of doing their part. Uh, in, in, and it's all a very transparent process. So if we do get hung up anywhere, it's pretty clear um, you know where a bottleneck might exist exist, and then you know what steps we can take to quickly make sure that uh, things get moved along. So, uh, we're, That's one we're of my favorite of parts of, of this process that we've noted in previous conversations is that it is a mandate to communicate with the community at least every 30 days on the progress of any idea so that everybody knows where it's at and what needs to happen next. Absolutely. Yeah, I think... Uh, Actually, this this is Chip. I just want to, you know, to, to reinforce a lot of this. You, you think about every idea is actually you know, intellectual property, an asset for the organization, whether it's implemented this week, this month, next month, or, or put on the shelf, it's still, you know, an asset and it should be treated as such. Um, it, it's, this is, this is, except maybe the things in the blue, maybe the offensive ones, maybe we could kind of say are liabilities rather than assets. But, uh, you know, and, and it's good to see that you're, you're, you're treating them as, you know, as, as something that do, as things that have value and need to be, you know, not just ideas, but this is stuff that's important. Definitely. Well, I think uh, one of the last questions I wanted to get to before we opened it up to uh, the audience for questions is, what sort of, you know, considering everything we've talked about, what behaviors are the most important to encourage within an innovation community? Tip, do you want to start out and then we can talk about what Yale's doing? Sure. Um, you know, on one hand, you know, it's, well, you, you can leave this slide up um, or put the next one up. Uh, or, or, but, you know, it's a lot of this comes back to culture. Um, you're, you're trying to get people to leave their comfort zone. Um, you know, we did a survey and, and, you know, biggest inhibitors and challenges are, are time and people, financial, and then basically everything else comes down to culture. Um, there's risk involved in doing things differently. There's time that you're asking people to invest. Uh, people exposing their ideas to others, you know, where somebody may, you know, say something not nice about them or that it's a silly idea, which never makes anybody feel good. Um, so, you know, one of the behaviors is, is just make sure you worry about the culture. Make sure you make it a safe environment. Uh, make sure that when you, you know, have an idea owner, um, that 
them deciding to put that idea on the shelf and not pursuing it is not thought of as a failure, but as a, a, a you know a thank you. That was the right thing to do. Um, it, it's a different sense of measurement. Uh, closing the loop. You know, we've seen too many programs where you know the first campaign they get 200 ideas and they pick three for funding. The second campaign, they get 50 ideas because 150 people decide it wasn't worth their time or effort to play. And then the third one, they get 20. I mean, these are these are not healthy programs. Um, so the, the closing the loop. And then little things. Um, you know, when ideas are submitted, keep management's hands out of it. Um, let them be developed organically uh, among the peer groups before you know, managers or, or executives, you know, put their two cents in. There's nothing that'll s stop a conversation more or, or lead it in the wrong direction than a high level person saying, this is a good idea or this is a bad idea, um, you know, too early in the, uh, in the discussion period. Those are three little, you know, things. Again, they all sort of come back to the culture and inclusiveness and, and understanding roles and responsibilities and, and, and empathy and, and a lot of the things that the folks at Yale were talking about. Yeah, Yale, do you have anything to add about what behaviors are important to cultivate within a community? Sure. So uh, one of the things that Brian's very fond of saying is that culture is consistent behavior over time. And when we talk about the behaviors that we're looking to incentivize here as part of our innovation initiative, uh, you know, like I said, ITS is a pretty large organization and you've got a lot of uh, staff who have been here for a very long time. Um, we're looking for people who are genuinely enthusiastic about what we're doing here. Um, we're, we're looking for those folks who are still, you know, very optimistic about how we can improve the services that we offer, how we can improve, you know, everything that we do and genuinely believe that it's possible. And that's really the, the people who we're trying to reach first and foremost. Um, another behavior that we really care deeply about is trust. Um, and for managers of staff particularly, uh, placing trust in their staff. We hear the word empowerment thrown around a lot, but we really, we, we talk about authentic empowerment. Again, the authenticity factor where you have both the confidence in your people, you know, and the knowledge that they, they've, they're equipped with the tools that they need to execute on the things that, that, that you're delegating to them. And that's where, you know, we believe empowerment really shines. And, and another thing about trust, uh, that's one of the reasons why we don't allow anonymity in our process, because we feel like when you're trying to foster an environment of open, honest, and safe discourse, as, as Chip mentioned, uh, you, you don't do that with, with uh, hidden identities. You do that by, you know, again, engaging with people openly and honestly and knowing who you're talking to and feeling safe. You know, if, if you've got something that you might consider a little bit, you know, controversial, it's okay because we're all in this together and we're all approaching it with the same spirit and we're all approaching it in good faith. So really it's, it's, a, more broadly, I guess the, the, the single behavior that we want to incentivize is communitarianism. It really is about community building and, uh, you know, making sure that we, we all realize the inherent value in this and uh, making it part of who we are and what we do every day. Excellent. Who came well, up with that I, word? I think which, which one of you came up with the communitarianism word? It's a wonderful word. <laughs> I'm gonna give uh, I'm gonna give all the credit to Lou on that one. <laughs> it's but it, it's exactly what you were talking about. It sums it up very nicely. It's just it's a it's a great word for that reason. Well, thank you. Well, I uh, we're, we've uh, we've been talking for a while now. We already have some questions in the question feed, so um, I think I'm going to get us set up to answer some questions here and uh, see the first one is sort of what we were just talking about how does organizational culture play out in this especially one that is resistant to change or complacent are there best practices to overcome those points of resistance Does anybody um, well you know some things that I've seen work 
you know, a lot of this is you really want to make the people who have gone out and exposed themselves to risk uh, into heroes. Whether their idea, as I said, panned out or not, you need to be talking up the fact that so-and-so had an idea and we're exploring it and we think it's, you know, something that might, might um, produce significant business value. Um, and even if it's not, you know, you can at the end of a quarter or end of a six months or, or whatever, talk about people who were involved in the program as, you know, the people who will help to drive the organization to the next level without necessarily talking about the success of, of any specific idea or, or their person, you know, you can be talking about the participation and the fact that they participated and the fact that they went out is so good. Um, that That's just a simple way to do it. Uh, and, 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 and many times that's, all, that's enough, but, but again, things like making sure that if, you, if somebody's gonna spend six months exploring an idea or four months or two months, and it doesn't work out that they have a you know that it does not cost them in their in their uh, in their job development or such. So Yale, you, I'm sure you have some specifics that you've done. And yeah, so I mean, I I think that's a great question because that's one of the most daunting tasks that we faced when we were getting started. You know, that when you're talking about a 300 year old institution, you know, there's there is a lot of traditionalism, and uh, you know, culture change does not come easy. Uh, we, again, I mentioned how fortunate we are to have our CIO, Len Peters, be sponsoring and openly embracing this initiative. And uh, e even at another level, uh, Yale has a, a relatively new president in Peter Salovey, who during uh, his, one of his inaugural addresses uh, said something to the effect of, innovation is part of our DNA at Yale. I mean, you don't, you don't get much more of a, of a shining example than that kind of a statement. So. It, it starts at the top, but then for the people who, have, like I said, the people who are here working every day, we want to make sure that we're communicating the value proposition to them. You know, what's in it for me? That that sort of uh, notion. And and when you're working in a particular area within technology, uh, sometimes all it takes is to see uh, a success demonstrated by one of your peer groups or or one of your peer teams. You know, I call that the trophy case effect, where you know, uh, say Brian's in a group and he, he's looking at something that, uh, that another team has done, and it may not be sort of a one-to-one -one analog that he can implement directly, but he may, he may get the, the seed of an idea from that initiative and be able to apply it locally. And, you know, that, that success has a way of going viral and rep replicating itself. And I think once you've shown people, hey, this isn't just a bunch of fluff, there's real positive change that can come out of this that's when it starts to really take root and begin to grow into the soil of the organization. And, and that's how I think you start to overcome some of the change resistance, especially again in a, in a place that is a highly traditional environment. Once you can show you know, demonstrable proof, and that's sort of what we did in the pilot uh, that Jessica mentioned, we, we wanted to show that yes, this, this is something that can generate you know, tangible value and do it quickly. So I think that got some notice too, is that when you can demonstrate these kinds of successes, people want to latch onto that. They say, I want to do that too. I want that for my team and my group and my part of the organization. Um, so that's just some thoughts that I had. I can uh, kick it over to Brian if he's got something. Sure. I mean, this is all going back to that concept of culture being uh, that result of, of consistent behavior. When we started out uh, as you know this innovation team, uh, several years ago, we met significantly more resistance. Uh, it, it takes perseverance. It takes quite a bit of uh, putting your, your own neck out a little bit, uh, but doing it regularly in a professional manner and you know, just not giving in and giving up. Um, it, it shows that, uh, that this is something that can grow and can go forward. And I would say that uh, that's the, the most important thing is to maintain that level of consistency. Um, it makes a tremendous difference. Excellent. I've got a, another question coming in here um, asking, how does current project management theory and best practices play out in this environment? Is there anything new or novel or different? I 
So, so I, I'll, I'll say something quick on this. Um, I think in general, uh, our goal with the process that we have established was to allow uh, project management to remain as it is for the way that Yale and IT operates. Uh, we framed everything around it to support innovation around our current structure. Uh, and it's not to say that, that there won't be changes in the future, um, but the, the real goal was to make sure that ideas could get to the point right. where a project could evolve from them so that leadership would hear the big, the small, and medium-sized ideas that had been properly refined. Yeah, and I, 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 I think I agree with Brian in that we see this process as sort of a feeder for the project management organization. You know, it's, it's a, another intake valve for them. And I think I hear a little bit of a, a note in that question about just sort of the challenge of, of, of operationalizing some of this stuff. And one other thing I'll say that's not directly related to project management, but is, is related to that sort of uh, operationalizing things. Uh, we're, we're trying to encourage managers of staff uh, at, their, at their weekly meetings to begin to devote some time to innovation, uh, you know, particularly uh, ideas that have bubbled up within their specific domains and to discuss those ideas, uh, you know, openly and inclusively on a, on a regular basis, and we're also facilitating some of that open discussion through the, the communications and marketing that we do with NIT here, but it's about keeping the conversation going at, uh, at a number of different levels, not just in, in one communication vector or another. And that can very well, uh, you know, when it comes time to, to evaluate which projects are, are, you know, going to be considered for capital funding within a given fiscal year, uh, if, if, if this innovation process can be a feeder there and that can sort of, uh, and, you know, feed into the, what the project management office is doing, but also, you know, if, they, if they're looking to maybe adapt some of, of the things that they do, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not trying to force anyone to change the way that they do things. But if there's some examples that we're setting through the process that we've designed that can be valuable and transposed into other environments, we're certainly uh, open and welcoming of that. Yeah, I think the only there's caveat. There's a follow-up question here that was: uh, Do these product, service, or innovation champions have, or play a different role than they have in the past 20 years? Are there specific challenges? Uh, well, can in you reread. Sorry, I, I was going to ask if you could reread that question, Jessica. Do the product or innovation service champions have or play a different role than they have in the past 20 years? Is there anything different or new specific challenges? So I guess within the Yale, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I guess within the Yale environment, um, if you're talking about people that have been working in IT for 20 years, uh, you know, yeah, this is new. This is, this is something, uh, if, 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 if one of these folks is designated as a champion, as an advocate in this process, this is something, you know, on top of their day jobs. And that's, again, why we value their authentic engagement so much, because we're asking them to go a little bit of that extra mile and to give us some of their time. And that's not just the individual being okay with that. That's their management adapting and, and, and making it safe for them to devote time, uh, you know, to to do things like moderate the ideas and idea scale and update idea statuses and communicating with users. So those are new activities uh, and, and they can be layered on to really anyone in the organization who has demonstrated that sort of enthusiastic engagement and optimism like we talked about earlier. I, I'm not 100% sure that's what the question was asking. I hope uh, I, I at least hit somewhere near the mark. Hmm. Yeah, let me, um, Jessica, I, I just want to say a couple of things that I've seen, and it sounds like Yale is doing a pretty good job of, of avoiding some of the pitfalls. Um, but again, the notion of, of project management and product management, you know, and, and think about how they deal with risk. Um, you know, once something is funded, project managers are very often measured on, you know, on time, on budget delivery. When you're thinking about something that's not incremental, when it's more the exploratory, where you're you're incubating it, you're exploring it, you ha you can't be using those same metrics. 
you you need to be willing to put something on the shelf if it's not panning out. And that is a, a change for, for some project managers. It, it's a different way of looking at things. Um, yeah, and then and that also then brings up, you know, something which is that uh, it's sometimes hard for people to time slice. So if they're trying to work on both operational and innovative projects at the same time, okay, now wait, which one am I working on? Is this one of the ones where 60% success is okay? Or is this one of the ones where 100% success is what they're looking for? Um, oh, whatever, you just, you, you, my mind can't handle it, ah! Uh, okay. I'm being a little bit dramatic, but you see where I'm going. It's, uh, there, there are differences in the, the stuff you know and the stuff you don't know. And we have to be cognizant of, of, you know, we want to manage them as projects because they're assets and we're putting our corporate funds and, and resources into exploring them. But we have to make sure that we don't, you know, burden them with the same kind of controls and, and in goals and expectations uh, that we might if they are, you know, in a formal product, you know, product and process management program. That's all, right. my two cents there. Might have been worth even more than two cents, perhaps. Okay. But that, uh, that brings us to the top of the hour. I want to make sure that we finish on time here. Um, so I want to thank all, both, both teams, our Forrester and um, our Yale Innovation Alignment team. It was a lot of really great information today. I um, want to reiterate again, if anybody has any follow-up questions, uh, please go ahead and feel free to send them to me. Um, it was great talking to everybody today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you, and thanks to everyone listening. Yeah. Talk to you all soon. Bye. Bye.